Welcome, I'm Liu Jimura, a Senior Principal Researcher at Microsoft. Today I want to tell you about the Augmented Mathematical Intelligence Project, AMI for short. Our goal is to assist humans in mathematical problem solving. Our session today is divided in three parts. I'm going to start telling you about the Lintio Improver, Formal Mathematics, and the AMI project. Then Professor Kevin Buzzard will tell you how Lean is, in the frontier, is being used in the frontiers of mathematics. Professor Buzzard is a member of the Lean community and one of the developers of MathLib, the Lean Mathematical Library. In the last part, Dr. Daniel Selson is going to tell you about Ada, the AI assistant for mathematics being built at Microsoft. You should view the Lean to Improver as a development environment for mathematics. Here we have Visual Studio Code being used to edit a simple Lean file. Lean has definitions. You are defining two functions in this example, the eval and times function. Lean has definitions, but it also has theorems. Here, the theorem eval times is proving a simple property about the times function defined above. Like modern programming languages, you, can, you have IntelliSense in Lean. You can hover over any objects in your file, and Lean will give you additional information about these objects. We also have autocompletion and features such as jump to definition. This is really useful, as it is useful in for software development is also use, very useful for mathematics. When you're proving a complex theorem, sometimes you, you are using another theorem that has been proved before, and being able to jump to the definition of this theorem is extremely useful. On the right panel, we have the Lean Info View. Right. It gives you additional information about any points in your file. In this example, you can click anywhere in the proof and Lean will show you the exact state of the proof at that point. This is very useful when you are navigating a complex proof developed using Lean. For more information about the Lean project, you can click the link on the bottom of this slide. We are very grateful for the Lean community. The Lean project has the contributions of countless volunteers. Here we have an animation built by Andre Bauer. He uses information stored on GitHub in the MathLib repository. Here we see hundreds of mathematicians working together, something we have never seen before. The, we say this is a math hive. The Lean Mathematical Library is paper is authored by the MathLib community. There will be so many authors in this paper that we decide to use just the MathLib community. For more information about the Lean community, you can follow the link on the bottom of these slides. In the Lean community website, you are going to find manuals, documentation, educational material, games built on top of Lean, and you can browse the MathLib library without even installing Lean. In this example here, we have documentation for the category of schemes, an object that is part of the algebraic geometry module. MathLib is not just important for math, but also for software verification. Suppose that you're a software developer building the next generation crypto library. Number theory is essential. If you want to prove properties about your new algorithm, you can use MathLib because it has many, many theories about number theorem that are there that can be reused by you. The MathLib project started in 2017 and is growing rapidly. Today, we have more than 27,000 definitions, 60,000 theorems, and almost 200 contributors. More than 600,000 lines of code have been written in MathLib. MathLib is also the foundation for more complex projects like the Lean Perfectoid Spaces, developed by Kevin Buzzard, Johan Komelin, and Patrick Massur. Here, this group explains what Peter Show's definition of perfectoid space is to Lean. This is a very complex definition. This is fields level, fields metal level mathematics, right? This object is extremely complex, and it's really hard to explain in using informal language. Uh, 
But here you have a digital version, a formal version of these objects. You can navigate through these objects using VS Code, right? Visual Studio Code. For example, if you don't know what a Tate ring is, you can just click on this object and ask Visual Studio Code to jump to its definition. By having these objects formalized in Lean, we also can use this data to create visualizations automatically. The graph on the right-hand side was generated automatically by a program written in Lean by Patrick Massot. Here we see all the dependencies of this project. If you go to the Math Overflow website, this popular website used by mathematicians for asking questions, you're going to find a question about uh, perfectoid spaces. And one of the most popular answers is, is an answer that is just a link to the Lean development. Right, to this project that was being done using the Lean to Improver. A recurrent question is, should I trust Lean? Lean is a big piece of code, and like any big piece of software, it contains bugs. And now you may wonder, are the terms proved in Lean really correct? Well, Lean has a small trusted proof checker. Lean may be big, but this proof checker, the Lean kernel, is a small piece of code. Right, much, much smaller than Lean itself. Well, you may say, well, it's small, but it may still have bugs, right? Well, you can export your proofs. You can export your proofs and check them with external checkers, right? These checkers have been implemented in different programming languages, such as Haskell, Scala, Rust, to cite a few. They were not implemented by us, the Lean developers, but by the community. Right, And still, you may not trust these checkers too. You may decide to implement your own checker. This is feasible. Any one of these checkers is not a big piece of code. It's between 1,000 and 2,000 lines of code. You can implement your own if you want. We're enabling decentralized collaboration with the Link project. We have two main ingredients here. We have metaprogramming, the ability to extend Lean using itself. You can prove terms using Lean, but as we said before, you can also use Lean to define functions. Some of the functions are mathematical functions, but some of them can be extensions to Lean itself. You can implement proof automation, that are programs that automate repetitive steps when you're proving a theorem. You can build visualization tools like the one that generates the graph on the bottom of these slides, and custom notation. Right? Formal proofs allow us to reuse proofs from each other without trusting each other. You can use my proofs without trusting me. I'm a human, I can make mistakes, but any proof built by someone else can be checked by the proof kernel, the link kernel, this small piece of code. Uh, more importantly, you can also use my proof automation no matter how complicated this piece of code is that's generating proofs automatically for you without trusting my abilities. Uh, we say you can hack without fear. This is essential for the Lean Ada assistant, right? Ada is a complex piece of software. You don't need to trust it. It will produce a, 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 a formal proof that can be checked by the Lean kernel. Uh, the future is now. The Lean projects have impact today. Here you have two articles. The first one on the Wired magazine describes the efforts of building MathLib. It interviews many mathematicians that are part of the Lean community. And as I said, MathLib is the foundation for more ambitious projects, like the liquid tensor experiment that has been recently reported by Nature. There, the Lean community assisted Peter Schoese, a Fields medalist, to ensure his new result is correct. The theorem he cares about was so complex that not even him could navigate this complex theorem. We are going to learn more about this project uh, in the next part when Kevin Buzzard will do a deep dive. These are just two examples. On the Lean website, you're going to find many other articles in pop popular science magazines, podcasts, and videos, right, that are accessible even if you don't know formal mathematics, theorem proving, or math itself. 
We believe the AMI project will accelerate the revolution. This project has two main pillars. On one side, we have the mathematical digitalization efforts, where we are creating a progressive tower of abstractions, libraries, and tools to digitalize all mathematics. This part will feed the second one, the machine problem solving part, where we're developing AI that will train on digitized math to solve problems automatically. This AI will assist humans in digitizing more math, creating a positive feedback loop. Today, you can track progress on undergraduate level mathematics digitalization online following the link on, on the top of these slides. A lot has been done, but you have a long way to go. The AMI project will accelerate progress here. We also believe you are ready for bigger challenges, like digitalizing Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem is easy to state, but the proof is massive. It's fair to say that no human today knows every single detail of this proof. By having it in digital form, formalized in Lean, you will be able to zoom in to any detail of this proof. The, the Lean community believe, believes you are ready to attack this kind of problem, and the AMI project will support this effort. Another grand challenge is the formalization of the Stacks library. This library contains more than 7,000 pages of algebraic geometry. This is a valuable source of information, but such engines do not work well in this domain. Today, such engines cannot answer basic questions such as, has this theorem been proved before? We believe, writes, the AMI will make a big difference here. As Professor Buzzard says, we are digitalizing math and we will make it better. The machine problem solving pillar Right, is where we, uh, Ada is the main ingredient here. The, in the base of this, on the base of this pillar, we have the lean proof checker, this small piece of code that can check any proof built using lean. Users are going to use Visual Studio Code or any other editor that supports the, the language server protocol. These editors are sending commands to Lean that will assemble the proofs for us. Lean is using proof automation, symbolic reasoning. As an example, a user can ask Lean to simplify a formula, reduce its complexity. A user can ask Lean to solve a system of equations automatically for them. Right? All these tasks are algorithmic. We have procedures and they exist today. Terms in math are built on top of each other. We need a strong foundation, and this is what is being provided by MathLib. And finally, we have Ada, our AI assistant that will be running on the cloud. Right? Ada is a complex piece of software, but you don't need to trust Ada. Ada is producing formal proofs, formal objects that can be checked by the Lean Proof Checker. It will assist mathematicians to achieve more. This is the end of the first part of our session. Thank you very much for your attention. In the next part, Professor Buzzard will tell you more about Lean, MathLib, and the liquid tensor experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. My name's Kevin Buzzard, and I'm a professor of pure mathematics at Imperial College in London. Uh, so in the next 15 minutes, the plan is I'm going to say something about what modern mathematics is and what mathematicians do. Uh, I'm going to say something about the relationship between mathematicians and computers, and I'm going to end by describing an ongoing project in a rapidly developing new area, somewhere between, uh, somewhere on the boundary between mathematics and computer science. Work which spans several areas like this is often very interesting because uh, it can give rise to uh, synergy and insights when experts in different areas start discussing uh, com the same material. So there's the plan, and we're going to start by uh, talking about what mathematicians do. So for very young children, you know, most people uh, meet mathematics as a young child. Uh, mathematics that they see is often about uh, you know, calculating numerical values. You know, first, first we learn to count, then we learn addition, subtraction, and multiplication, and then we learn algorithms such as column addition. And then we're faced with questions like, you know, what's 158 plus 91? And the idea is we have a method, we have an algorithm 
you know, column addition. You write these numbers down with the units in the same column and the tens in the same column. And uh, you add things up line by line. And we learn the algorithm, and then we can add up very large numbers like this. Uh, and we're also taught geometry at a young age, and geometry gives us a new, you know, a new source of, uh, of questions involving calculations. But actually, geometry uh, can also be the cause of headaches uh, amongst students because uh, there are high school geometry questions where there isn't a method, where you can't just apply the method. You actually have to think about the facts that you know and put them together in the right order, an innovative order. This is like the art of mathematics. For example, you might be taught theorems about angles in triangles and angles in parallel lines, and then you're faced with some diagram with some triangles and some parallel lines, and you're asked to compute some angle. And uh, the direct computation won't work. We don't know what the angle is, but you can start using facts, circle theorems or triangle theorems, and to figure out new information from information you have. And you have to use your intuition more. So some students find these uh, questions more difficult uh, than the calculation questions because there's no method. At university level, uh, even more emphasis is placed on reasoning. So I, I often see students coming into my university who are very strong at calculations, but you know they want to know what the method is. What's the method, they ask? And unfortunately, sometimes there is no method. You know, sometimes you just have to use the tools you have uh, in innovative ways. And really, you know, the, the key ideas are you need to learn how to use the tools uh, which we're teaching you at university. And in research mathematics, it's just the same thing. It's a mixture of calculating and reasoning. So you know, this is a broad generalisation, but uh, pure mathematicians are people whose work is mostly about reasoning. You know, they define new structures and they prove theorems about these structures using only the rules of mathematics. Uh, and they, you know, we develop theoretical tools in, in the pure math side of things. And applied mathematicians use these tools to solve real-world problems. For example, they might be uh, you're interested in things like weather prediction or internet security. In fact, uh, some of the early examples of uh, encryption techniques which were used uh, for things like online credit card transactions on the internet, these were, you know, these were invented using uh, tools which were developed by number theorists uh, many years earlier. So pure mathematicians developed the tools and applied mathematicians use them. And uh, calculations may well be a key part of the work of an applied mathematician. So where do computers fit into all this? Well, of course, uh, way before computers, mathematicians were using machines to do calculations for them. Uh, for example, the abacus or the slide rule. Uh, but when computers came along, mathematicians al almost instantly started using them uh, to, do, to do their calculations. And, and nowadays, of course, you know, the computers are ubiquitous in mathematics departments and, of course, in many other places as well. Uh, but the question is, what about the pure mathematicians who want to do reasoning? Can we use computers to reason or, or can, we, can we use computers to help humans with their reasoning? Uh, can, can computers help pure mathematicians? And you might be quite surprised to know that actually uh, the computers, computers are used far less often by pure mathematicians than applied mathematicians. Uh, to give an example, in the 1990s, Richard Taylor and Andrew Wiles uh, proved Fermat's last theorem. This was an old question that had been open for hundreds of years. Uh, it was a statement about numbers, uh, but the proof did not involve computers at all. The proof just involved you know, using complex structures and proving theorems about these structures you know, using, using pen and paper. Uh, so why are computers not being used in this domain? Uh, let me explain the fundamental problem of it. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. This is a conjecture. Uh, this is a conjecture about cubic equations in two variables. You know, here's an example: uh, y squared is x cubed plus 37. So what does the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture say about this equation? Uh, well, they start off by attaching two numbers to this equation. Uh, one of the numbers uh, you create using algebra, which is the study of the discrete, and the the other number you create using analysis. Uh, which is the study of the continuous. So there are two numbers that one can attach to such an equation, and the techniques we use are very, very different uh, to calculate those two numbers. 
And uh, the observation of Birchland's winners and Dyer, their conjecture, is that those two numbers which are attached to the equation, one using algebra and one using analysis, uh, the conjecture is that those two numbers are always equal. So this is an unsolved problem, and it's in fact an incredibly famous problem. It's a Clay Millennium problem. Uh, the Clay Foundation uh, published a list of seven problems uh, in the year 2000 that they thought mathematicians should be working on uh, in the 21st century. And they offered a million dollar prize for each of these, uh, for each of these conjectures. And this was, this was one of these conjectures. Uh, so if you can solve the Birch and Swindles and Dyer conjecture, you get a million dollars. So why aren't we solving it using computers? Uh, let, me, let me try and explain why that is. The, ironically, uh, the, uh, the conjecture was discovered uh, by computer experimentation uh, with very early computers. But here's the reason that you can't prove the Birch, Swindles and Dyer conjecture using a computer in the naive way. The Birch and Swindles and Dyer conjecture is a statement about all cubic equations in two variables. And so it's a statement about infinitely many equations. You see, numbers are infinite. This is one of the first things we learn about them. We learn to count, and then we realise that for every number, there's a number after it. So the Birch and Swindleton Dyer conjecture is a statement about infinitely many equations, and thus it cannot be solved by a finite calculation. You can check it for a million of these cubic equations, or even a billion or a trillion, but there's infinitely many. So in some sense, you've got nowhere. So... What is mathematics? A mathematical problem is just a logic puzzle, really, just like a Sudoku puzzle or a chess puzzle. And of course, we can teach computers uh, the rules of Sudoku or of chess. And similarly, we can teach computers the rules of mathematics. But uh, one of the consequences of teaching computers the rules of Sudoku is that computers can solve Sudoku problems you know, in the fraction of a second. And one of the consequences of having taught computers the rules of chess is that computers can now beat chess grandmasters at chess. You know, computers have got very, very good at these things. So we can teach computers the rules of mathematics. And the Lean Theorem Prover, you know, written by Microsoft Research, is exactly that. It's a computer proof system which knows these rules. So this is the very beginning of the adventure, as far as mathematicians are concerned. But unfortunately, because mathematics is infinite, there's infinitely many numbers, Unlike chess or Sudoku, you know, mathematics is a game being played on an infinite board. So the techniques we have to solve Sudoku problems uh, or to beat grandmasters at chess, they might not scale to mathematics because we have to leap from the finite to the infinite. And this is what makes the question so much more difficult. So can computers help humans uh, do their mathematical research involving reasoning? I guess as a first step... We have to consider the much simpler question, which is, can computers even understand the questions uh, which mathematical researchers are considering in 2021? And uh, this is one of the goals of Lean's mathematics library, MathLib. Uh, MathLib is a gigantic database of definitions and theorems which pure mathematicians use. And it's growing all the time. It's about four years old. It's well over half a million lines of code now. It's approaching two thirds of a million lines of code. And it contains... All essentially all of undergraduate pure mathematics, well, you know, most of it by now, a, a lot of MSc level mathematics, and we're encroaching into research level, uh, into research level mathematics. This is this is one of the absolute prerequisites for getting for getting pure mathematicians that are doing reasoning to use computers. The first thing we have to do is to make sure they understand the question, and this is you know we have a very viable uh, we have a very viable approach for this. More and more of the research level questions which mathematicians are working on can be understood by Lean equipped with its maths library, MathLib. So right now, what can we do with this library right now, this gigantic library? We can use it with undergraduate teaching. I use it to teach undergraduates in a, in a new way. Uh, MathLib opens up the possibilities for search. If you, if you want to know if a theorem has been proved, you can search the database to see if it's in the library. Semantic search is a, you know, is a big deal for mathematicians. And as you know, as the systems get better, we're going to be seeing more and more mathematicians using these for search. Uh, MathLib can also be used as a, you know, it's a big, you know, it's a big amount of data. So AI people can use it to train, you know, they can train their machine learning algorithms on this big chunk of data. But also it can be used by other projects that want to engage with a small amount of harder mathematics, modern research level mathematics. You can use MathLib as a dependency in that way. 
So let me end by talking about the liquid tensor experiment. Uh, here's the background to this. The Fields Medal is like the Nobel Prize of mathematics. And the 2018 Fields Medal is Peter Schultzer and his collaborator Dustin Clausen. They proved a theorem in 2020 which enables us to use algebraic techniques in certain areas of geometry where this was not previously possible. So the hope is these techniques are already yielding new proofs of old results and uh, the hope is that these techniques will go on uh, to give us a new way of attacking questions in this area and proving new theorems in this area of geometry uh, where, this, where, these, uh, where these theorems apply. So in late 2020, uh, Peter Schultz raised uh, the following challenge. He said, uh, can these computer proof systems check a key result in his work? So it's, it's interesting to ask, why did he ask this question? And the reason he asked this question was Schultz looked at how the mathematical community were assimilating his results and kind of and, and using them and beginning to understand them. And he became concerned that they were not checking the, the intricate details of the arguments. For example, he asked me whether our study group in London had, uh, had uh, checked these careful details. And we'd looked at lots of the things that they were doing, but we hadn't gone through everything with a fine tooth comb. And Schultz said, this is new material and I believe it's very important. This needs to be checked. And I'm not convinced uh, that the human system is scaling. Right. Is, the idea is that humans check other humans' work. But when it comes to technical things, Schultz was asking people and people were saying, well, you know, we just kind of assumed these things and didn't, didn't check all the details carefully. So we began to wonder whether a computer proof system, you know, whether they're powerful enough in 2021 uh, to actually embark on trying to check some of his results. So by early 2021, uh, the key technical intermediate lemma, which he felt that no human had checked properly, it had been isolated and we'd stated it uh, in the Lean Theorem Prover using this gigantic maths library. We had a project that sat on top of that maths library and we'd stated the question. So now uh, the challenge becomes a computer game. Can we, can, we prove, can we prove this theorem? And a group of mathematicians from all over the world uh, started working on this. They were collaborating online using the internet, this is somehow, you know, we were doing mathematics in a new way. And a few months later, we managed to prove the, this lemma that Schultz was worried about. And this is his response. Uh, he said, you know, as, as part of a blog post, I'm excited to announce that the experiment has verified the entire part of the argument that I was unsure about. I find it absolutely insane that interactive proof systems are now at that level where within a very reasonable time span, they can formally verify original research. So this was, this was the Lean Theorem Prover and its maths library being used to actually help a modern mathematician you know, with, a, with an interesting problem that they'd come up with. They weren't convinced uh, that the community were reading their work. So just to summarise then, Lean's maths library, maths lib, it, it can turn mathematics into a computer game. There are other systems which can also do this. Uh, but the difference between MathLib is it's engaging with research level mathematics and turning that into a computer game. So it's also enabling collaboration at scale. There are many people that can work on, on one project together using the kind of collaboration tools we have nowadays. Uh, and we're also you know, modelling difficult modern abstract objects on a computer. We don't really know where this is going, but this is like digitising mathematics. This is something that hadn't been done before, digitising modern mathematics. So it's, it's taking us into unknown territory. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Selsom, and I'll be discussing a new effort we're launching to build an AI assistant for mathematics. And our project is called Ada, named after this wonderful art installation in the lobby of the Microsoft Research Building in Redmond. Now, here is the dream. The dream is that a lean user defines a formal statement of some hypothesis of interest, in this case, the, the famous Riemann hypothesis, and just ask the system to prove it. And then Ada, the uh, future version of Ada, will start searching. And maybe a few seconds or weeks or decades later, Ada claims that it finds a proof. Now, it doesn't matter how inscrutable Ada is, it might just be uh, a large neural network. It might be something even wilder. It might have evolved in some kind of physics evolutionary simulation. It doesn't matter. 
And it also doesn't matter how sophisticated or incomprehensible the proof it finds is. Uh, it might be a billion lines of alien mathematics that's beyond the capacity of any human brain to understand. This also doesn't matter because as long as it produces a formal proof, the lean kernel can verify it for us, at which point we have essentially 100% confidence that the Riemann hypothesis has been proved and the world rejoices. Now, the dream extends beyond just mathematical proof. So in this example, a user might define precisely what it means to be a gradient optimizer in some context. They might define some precise mathematical property of such an optimizer. For example, that it has some uh, amazing regret bound and ask the system to discover a gradient optimizer that satisfies this property. And as before, Ada may uh, find, may start searching and find a candidate gradient optimizer, and it can find a proof that it satisfies this amazing regret bound. And then as before, it doesn't matter how complicated Ada is, it doesn't matter how complicated the optimizer is or the proof, uh, Lean can successfully verify the proof for us. And in this case, maybe the user profits because their ML system trains more effectively. And the dream extends even further beyond proof, beyond mathematical logic itself to include empirical metrics. So in this example, a user is asking the system to discover some assembly language program that has the same mathematical semantics as some baseline Python script, and that also best effort empirically minimizes a performance on some benchmark. And Ada may find a candidate program. Lean can confirm that this program gives you an, a million X speed up on this performance benchmark. And then Ada can find a proof that it's correct, at which point, even if the assembly language program and the proof of correctness are inscrutable, uh, it doesn't matter. We all have a uh, very, very high, essentially 100% confidence that this program does what we want. And in this case, uh, oh, sorry, after Lean successfully verifies the proof, we have this confidence. And then in this case, maybe the organization says, let's super optimize all of our systems or let's rethink how we develop all software. Uh, now, this dream may seem ridiculous. It may seem as out of reach as zipping through wormholes. But I want to note that it is merely an algorithmic problem. It is not a philosophical problem. We as a community know how to write formal statements in mathematics, in computer science, in statistics, in machine learning in software engineering, across the mathematical sciences, we can write formal encodings of even very, very sophisticated theorems. And as Leo stressed, uh, Lean can already verify arbitrarily sophisticated proofs. So there's very little trusted code. There are actually multiple independent proof checkers written in different languages, usually only between one and 2,000 lines of code each. There's a well understood meta theory. It's essentially 100% trustworthy. And to stress one more time, already today's lean can check arbitrarily sophisticated proofs, even ones that might be produced by super intelligent systems of the future. And finally, lean provides a perfect simulator for mathematics. So AIs can experiment on their own. There's no need to wait for humans to, to respond, to provide subjective feedback. There's no need to run physics, i.e. to see if the robot hand actually picks up the jar in reality. There's no gap between sim and real in our scenario. If a system learns to prove sophisticated theorems in simulation, it has learned to prove sophisticated theorems, period. And we're really excited to be launching a long-term campaign to realize this ambitious dream. Now, here's our very, very, very high level strategy. We want to use symbolic methods to formulate math as a kind of game that RL agents, uh, maybe not today's, but of the not too distant future, can win. And our mantra is that symbolic methods define the game and statistical methods play the game. Now, the game of math is like Go in many ways. I do think this is a useful analogy. But at the same time, it's almost, incompar almost incomparably more sophisticated and challenging than Go. So first, in the game of math, the state is massive and growing all the time. So in Go, the state is just a 19 by 19 array of triples with a little bit of extra history data. But in math, it's this massive environment object that includes all mathematics that has been formalized so far, all definitions, lemmas, theorems, proofs, all metaprograms that have been used to help produce those proofs. 
And all of the, the formulae and the goals and the proof steps only make sense in the context of this ever-growing environment. And also in math, actions can be long and complex. So in Go, an action is just a row column pair. Uh, but in math, an action is an arbitrarily large formula or proof step. And new, usually higher order action primitives are constantly being added to the state by humans and eventually by other AIs. And to make things even worse, proofs may require not just one, but arbitrarily long sequences of such complex actions with little or no intermediate feedback or reward before luckily stumbling on a proof of some deep result. And lastly, there's no clear way to bootstrap. So in Go, DeepMind was able to train a superhuman Go player from first principles by having the system play against itself over and over again. And this is a, a beautiful and inspiring approach, but there's no obvious analog in mathematics. So math is really only a well-defined game for specific conjectures that are fixed. Uh, the, the, you can sort of think of math as a two-player game where one player conjectures and the other proves, but this is a somewhat arbitrary formulation and it, it's a very asymmetric game anyway, and it doesn't have the right dynamics to bootstrap. I'd say it's, a, it's an open philosophical question if there are proxy metrics for mathematics that can turn human style theory building into a game at all. And the game of math is also uh, quite a bit like the sequence to sequence problem that current large language models have been excelling at. But there's also uh, another important difference, which is that the outputs in the game of math are held to a much, much higher semantic bar than is currently achievable by the state of the art. In other words, the outputs have to really, really make rigorous semantic sense. And this is right now very far uh, beyond the state of the art. Now, um, we, th this dream is obviously very broad and open-ended. So we wanted to come up with a grand challenge that was in the spirit of this dream, uh, but was still very, very concrete. And so we've proposed the IMO grand challenge, which is to build an AI that can win a gold medal in the International Mathematical Olympiad, or IMO, which is perhaps the most prestigious mental competition in the world. And we think it's a great proxy for the broader dream. There's an ongoing supply of new devious problems that are thought to require tremendous ingenuity, even for humans or machines that have studied all previous problems. There's a well-defined notion of success, which is winning a gold medal. And there's broad consensus that there's no plausible way to brute force these problems. They're, they're really very sophisticated problems. Uh, but the downside of this challenge is that it's a very extremely unforgiving metric. So it's hard to even get a single point on this challenge. Uh, so our plan is to build up gradually from easier problems and easier competitions. Now, as Leo stressed, uh, the Lean community has been the major driving force of Lean. And we want to build similar community around the, the AI research questions. So please, please come talk to us and help us better articulate and contextualize the key scientific challenges. Help us produce the right intermediate benchmarks and metrics to measure and spur progress in, in many different of the AI subfields. Help us develop and expose the right APIs to support experimentation, and also help us develop the, the mechanisms that will incentivize public goods. For example, formalizing historical problems for use as both training data and evaluation data. And um, I want to close by saying that I'm really excited to discuss and collaborate with many of you moving forward. Thank you so much.